Welcome. Uh, this is a, pr a pretty long room here, so I probably uh, won't be seeing if you try to do uh, pose any questions or anything, but just shout out and, and I'll, I'll see if I can hear it. So, uh, how many of you were attending my presentation on Spring and Java E last year at JDD? Nobody. Oh, that's great. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> here he comes. <laughs> no, uh, actually, this is a completely uh, different presentation, and I just want to say that uh, if you were here last year, uh, it, it's no problem because uh, this is something new. So, uh, about myself, I have been coding Java since Java was new. In 95, I, I programmed my first Hello World in, in uh, 95 using Java in a nutshell for Java 1.0. Uh, I've done it professionally since 98. Uh, I'm working as, as, as a consultant. Uh, currently, I work for a consultant company called Cybercom. We're located in Sweden, but we also have offices here in Poland. Uh, we're hiring, by the way, uh, and uh, uh, I also worked in, in Norway and in uh, Denmark. I am Norwegian, uh, but the last 10 years I've been living in Sweden. Uh, I'm speaking at, at a couple of conferences, like you see here. Uh, I was at JDD last year, I was at Java 1 last year, uh, and uh, other conferences uh, around Europe and, and the rest of the world. Uh, currently, uh, I've recently become a member of the uh, JCP expert group for JSR 371, which is MVC for Java platform. And if you want to discuss that, that or anything else, just uh, come to me. I'm here for the entire conference. So what I'm going to talk about, uh, about today is uh, Spring 4, Java E7, and then combining the two uh, frameworks. And uh, uh, first, I'll just uh, uh, give a short intro to what Spring is, uh, some history, and then I'll quickly go through what Spring 4 uh, brought to us. Then I'll do the same for Java E7. And uh, if you have been using Java E7 and Spring 4 for a long period of time, then just sleep through this part of the presentation or tweet about how awesome it is or do whatever. But there will be code and there will be demo afterwards. So let's get going. A little history. Uh, Java EE, or as it was called then, Java Professional Edition, first was talked about in 98. And then they changed the name to Java uh, 2 Enterprise Edition, J2EE, and that's been following through uh, version 1 or 2, 1 or 3, and 1 or 4, and it just grow bigger and bigger and less and less useful. So that's why Spring came in 2002, and the first milestone release of Spring was in 2004. So it's significantly newer framework, but it has been around for more than 10 years. And then something happened this, uh, uh, w w when the Java community started to thinking about the developers and how the developers are going to use this. And I looked at Spring and I lo looked at other frameworks and I looked around and I came up with ease of development, which was the great theme of Java E5. And that was just the start. Java E6 was much better but when Java E7 came in June last year, that, uh, that, uh, that's kind of the point where you felt that as a Java E developer, you were ahead of Spring for the first time. And then Spring 4 came this January, and it's currently uh, version 4.1. And it's kind of, uh, they're, they're very similar, as you will see in this presentation. So first, uh, I'll just go through uh, Spring Framework 4. How many is using Spring? So we, uh, version 4. OK. <laughs> uh, why? <laughs> uh, you should. It, it's, it's much better. 
Uh, me myself, I, I'm stuck in Spring 3 as well, but, but uh, that's another problem. Uh, spring 4 is uh, actually pretty awesome. Uh, these slides are a couple of months old, so they may be not completely updated, but I think this should cover it pretty well. These are the technologies that Spring Framework offers. You see, they have data access, they have web stuff, they have uh, aspects, they have uh, messaging, and they have th the core Spring container. And they also provide with test. But Spring, that's just XML, isn't it? Who, who, uh, how many of you are using XML for configuration? Uh, some of you, yeah. Because that's actually old school. Or uh, you could say, uh, uh, but this isn't new in Spring 4. This was in sp Spring 2, 3, I think, around there. Uh, and and uh, whether you like the XML configuration or the Spring configuration, that's pretty much a matter of taste. Somebody doesn't like the, the annotation, somebody doesn't like XML, uh, or maybe you think that both su sucks, as we heard earlier today. But anyway, these are the two ways you can uh, configure Spring. And, and uh, uh, if I should choose one of them, I I'd pick uh, uh, Java configuration any time of the day. So what's new in, in, in Spring 4 then? Well, they got a much better website. Yeah, uh, ha have you been uh, been to Spring I/O? Well, if you used to to look up Spring documentation earlier, it was a hassle, but now it's actually pretty easy to find. It's it's well documented. There are good examples, uh, tutorials. So that's a, that's actually a, a very big feature of uh, Spring Four. They also have Java Eight support. I'm not sure a couple of, of examples of that. First of all, they support the app repeatable, so you don't have to do this wrap the annotations in a wrapper annotations to have repeatable annotations. You can just put them on. More expressive, easier to read, does what it says. Spring is also cluttered with callback interfaces. And this is probably not by uh, uh, an, any intention or anything, but it's a perfect match for Lambda expressions and method references. So more or less by accident, they have excellent Java support. And that is a very good side effect of their uh, pretty consistent design. They have Java EU support, but it's Java EU 6 that is the baseline. It's based on server 3.0 and, and JPA 2.0. Uh, but they also support the newer Java specifications. They also have a couple of more that actually isn't supported by Java E at all. Like uh, uh, caching is, is, is much better in Spring than in Java E currently. They added the Groovy Bean definition language. Why? I mean, another definition language. Uh, it, not even the Spring guys take this up when they present Spring 4. So it's probably not a very big deal. Uh, they did some core container uh, updates. Like you can have uh, a generified injection uh, qualifiers here. So, so if you have a foo that is of integers, then it's i that get is gets injected. And if you have a foo of string, it's s. So it actually looks at the, qual uh, at the uh, generic qualifier to know what to inject. They did some improvement to, to make it easier. Uh, anybody who's using uh, WebMVC uh, knows that this is how you need to do when you're doing uh, uh, REST resources in, in Spring MVC. They've changed that and put it together in a REST controller. So it's easier to use, less likely to, to make errors. Uh, they have uh, uh, the Spring WebSocket and Spring Matching pa Packages, which supports the JSR 356 WebSockets. And they also have the SockJS fallbacks to support uh, uh, browsers like uh, uh, IA less than 10 and, and so on. And they also have uh, support for Stomp messaging to, to 
to message to, to uh, low socket clients. Th this is by, by I mean not all that was new in Spring 4, it's just a couple of things, but I just wanted to highlight them. So if we look at Java E7 then, and an overview of technologies. The boxes that are blue here are the specifications that were new in Java E7. The others were uh, updated of uh, existing uh, specifications. But you, you got a, a Java API for uh, JSON parsing, and you got the WebSockets uh, API, concurrent uh, say utilities, and batch applications, which were completely new specifications in Java E7. The other ones were, were uh, uh, updated. Note, for example, JMS. Who, who's been using JMS earlier? Okay, some of you. It's a hassle to, 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 do, to do all the JMS cluttering code to, to get a, a simple message to a queue. But now in JMS 2, it's, it's pretty much easier. And it's, it's been in, in uh, version 1 for forever. So that was barely on time. So the, the three main focus areas for Java E7 was developer uh, productivity, it was HTML5 support, and it was to meet the enterprise demand. And, and the platform is leaner than ever, it's a minimum of configuration uh, to get, get an a application up and running, and it's excellent annotation support and dependency injection throughout the platform. And, and I'll show later how easy it is. For uh, developer productivity, they took away a very large amount of configuration, uh, configuration and boilerplate code that you, that you needed before and stripped it down to a bare minimum. Uh, you don't need a web XML file. You don't need a beans XML file. You, you can have it, but it doesn't have, uh, don't have to. And, and the API has been aligned, so it's very coherent, and, and you, you it's familiar how you use it, I whether you program in WebSockets or REST or whatever. And there are lots of new annotations to make the code clearer and more concise. For example, EJBs. Everybody who has programmed an EJB in the late 90s or beginning of 2000 knew how painful it was. You had to implement like a heap of diff different interfaces, packages in a, se a separate jar, do J and I lookups everywhere, and, and, and it was just a configura configuration in hell to, to, to find out what you actually were doing. Nowadays, it's one annotation, and you have an EJB. It has transaction support, and it has what, uh, whatever you need. So EJBs are fun again. For uh, HTML5, uh, the things that facilitate this on the server side is uh, for WebSockets and JSON processing. And uh, for example, uh, WebSockets, to, to implement them, it's, it's uh, on the server side, it's a server endpoint annotation. And you have a couple of methods that you implement, like on message or on open, on close, uh, et cetera. And it's the same. On the client, if you make a Java client for a WebSocket, you annotate it with client endpoint, and you have an on message me method. It's pretty easy, and it's very similar to, for example, JAXRS. So if we look at the third focus area, which was meeting the enterprise demands, uh, they did th two things. Uh, one of them was to, to uh, add batches to Java E. So you can actually run batch jobs in your Java E web application if you want to. That's pretty cool. And as I said, there's an update to JMS 2.0. So this is how you configure JMS nowadays. And it's also a, a default uh, lookup uh, that uh, the vendors has to implement. So we can run it. Currently, there are three certified application servers. You have Glassfish, Wildfly, and Tmaxsoft. And Glassfish, I guess most of you have heard about. It's the reference implementation. It's in version 4.1 now. It supports Java 8. Uh, and Wildfly is in version 8.1, and that is the open source version of JBoss. So if you 
plan on go to a, a supported uh, commercial version of JBoss later, Wildfly is the same code base that the next version of JBoss will be. So that's a very good approach to take. TMaxSoft is a Korean approach, and it's not open source, and it's not easy to get started with. It's not as fast as it, the others. And I even Aaron Gupta gave up getting his demo running on TMaxSoft at his presentation at Java 1 this year. So, so it's not easy. But you can probably use it uh, if you know how to do it. So that was kind of the quick and dirty introduction part of Spring, Java E, and uh, what's new in the platforms. So now I'll, I'll go to a little more practical side of things. And, uh, but before I start with the actual demo, uh, let's just check how these frameworks overlap. So I have colored in purple here what Spring supports of the Java E7 platform. And you see, it, it, it's not all. And, and it's, it could have been maybe purpler here and there. They support Servlet 3.1 but it's based on 3.0, so it's, I, I could have drawn this one purple as well, but, a, and they have some of the other things, they have, they have transaction support, but they don't have EJBs. So, so, so uh, but you can see it, it supports a bit of the platform, but it has support for all of it other, but it's other technologies and it doesn't implement the specification. The other way around, Spring also has a lot of stuff that EJB or is Java E doesn't have, like test, for example. Spring has excellent support for testing, and, and that is lacking in, in Java E specification. You may argue if it should be in the specification or not, but there are tools that are good at it, and Archelion is gaining popularity for testing uh, your, your in-container applications. But the major differences between them is that Java E that relies on an application server that implements the specifications, whereas Spring actually brings the application server into your application, sort of, or at least its own container. Java E is that the container implements the specification, Spring brings in what it needs. So for a, a quick example. If you have a Java E application, it will run inside a container, a Java E container. You package it uh, typically as a WAR file. And you have some beans in there that you use CDI to, to uh, inject. Whereas in the Spring case, you have the same container run it. It doesn't have to be a Java E 7 certified container, because inside the WAR file, you bring the Spring container, the Spring context, where the uh, beans live. And, and you use, uh, I've used at AutoWire here, Spring supports at inject as well. So I could have used at inject here, but at AutoWire is the Spring way of doing it. So what, what if you want to mix these things? So since Java E relies on the, on the container and Spring brings the container, you have to have some kind of glue code in between to get it to work. And I'll show a couple of examples here. One of them, if you have a Java E application and you want to use a Spring component within it, then this is where the magic happens. Right? So you need, and I will show in the demo how to inject a Spring Managed Bean into your Java E application. And the add order virus is handled by the Spring framework itself. And the other way around, if you bring in a Java E or uh, Java E uh, dependent com component, and you want to use at AutoWired or uh, similar, you have to do some magic to get it to work. Right? 
So that brings us to the demo. And what I will do first is to take a Java EE application, I'll have a Spring component, and then I'll mix it in so we can use it. And then I'll just switch displays here. Hope you all can see. Okay. So I have my Java E7 application. As you see, there is no uh, web XML. Uh, there is, I'm sorry, there's no way to actually increase the font on, on the, the uh, Project Explorer here, but the fonts in the source code will be bigger. Uh, there is a JBoss web XML file, but that's just the context of the application, so it's it doesn't have anything in it. Otherwise, it's just Java code. And I'll look at the p uh, POM file first. And as you can see here, the only dependency I have in this is that I rely on Java EE Web API. And it's provided because it's there in a the container. But it's not packaged with my uh, WAR file. So if I look at my simple application, it is a uh, REST, REST application, it's a counter, and it has a message, and it has a, 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 a counter. It, it uh, responds to a HTTP GET, and it produces JSON. It takes in a, a name, and it defaults to Krakow if I don't supply a name. And it just sets a count and returns my count object which looks like this, it's just a simple with three counters. The counter itself is just counting the next. It, it is a singleton, so it will live throughout the application and, and uh, as people hit the, the resource, it will count up. And the configuration is standard JAXRS and saying that you're going to listen at slash API in my browser and that's it. I'm just doing logging here so we can see what's happening in the uh, in the log. So if I fire this one up, it should do as we expect. It says application deployed. And then login Java ESS. So if I r uh, run it here, you see that it counts as I hit it. And the counter is created once. There's no magic there, it's very simple. It's, it's as, uh, more or less as simple as you can get it. Uh, let's look at the, the spring equivalent. Uh, there you have a couple of more dependencies in the POM file since Spring uh, needs a little bit more to be uh, able to run. Uh, this one is actually, yeah, this is because I'm running in a 3 to 1 sort of container and Spring doesn't bring that. But the container does, so I can have the uh, provider, right? And otherwise, I'm using the latest release of Spring. Here also, I have <coughs> no uh, web XML files. Uh, I have uh, actually a, a context XML file, but that's because I've been running this demo in Tomcat uh, once. So that's it's just the context. Uh, the, the counter is exactly the same as it is in the Java, uh, just that is, it's a spring singleton. The counter resource is using the, the REST controller from Spring 4, and more or less, it just does exactly the same thing. It has a request mapping, and the annotations is a little bit different from JAXRS, but it does the same. It, it listens to count, it's a get, and it produces application JSON. 
And also here, default is Krakow for this message, unless you specify something. The count object is exactly the same. Configuration here is a little bit more, uh, but it's not that much. This is the uh, Java version of the WebXML file, and it just adds a server called Dispatcher for the WebMSE framework. And the actual configuration is just a couple of annotations. This one is new in Spring 4 as well, enable web MVC. So you don't need this dispatcher servlet XML file that you used to need in, in, in the old versions. And this one should run just as fine. Count. You see, it does the same thing. So now I'll just get a uh, my demo comment from uh, uh, Git, so it's easier not doing it wrong. And let's look at the Java E example first. Remember, what I'm going to do is to integrate a Spring component in my Java EE application first. And luckily, I have prepared a Spring 4 component here. And it's actually just two counters. It's a simple counter, which is a Spring component, and it just counts. And there's a more awesome counter this one actually uses the, the simple counter to count. So it has some water wiring, and it uses the application context just to log every, uh, every, every bean created. Oh, that was too wild, this. Well, it looks like this. Just logs the uh, name on the beams. And it has a configuration file that just does component scan. So don't need any, any uh, XML file, to application context, whatever, to, uh, to configure it. So if I want to put this into my, my Java E7 application, what I need to do is first is to add the dependency. There. Now I have it available on my class path. Then I need to start using it. And since I want to inject it using CDI into my beans, I need to create a producer for it. So I added a class called Spring Bean Producer. And the, the, the first thing I'm, I'm doing here is just to do it as dumbly and easy as possible. I just create a counter and I create a producers method that just returns the counter I created. Right? And in my count resource, I inject this simple counter. And I just set the simple count on the ca count object. And if we're lucky now, then the application should be deployed. And we should be able to run it. Java E. And you see, it counts. So now it uses a bean from a sp spring context. And then I would like to inject the awesome bean as well. And remember that this awesome bean is actually using auto wiring and is using the spring context. So this one I have to do a little bit differently. And what I have to do here is actually to look up the spring spring context. So what I do here is to load the 
annotation config application context from Spring. And I register the Spring application config, which is a class of the Spring uh, module. And I, ju I just read uh, context refresh, and I retrieve the bin from the Spring context, right? And then I should be able to inject it here and use it. And if we're lucky, it's deployed and it's counting. But if you notice here, we actually are doing something wrong. Because awesome count is using simple count, and simple count is counting itself. So actually, this number should be doubled. It should be counting two every time, right? And why is it so? Guys, what we're doing now is this. What we actually want to do is this, right? Because the simple, we're just creating it. So it's actually not managed by Spring. So we want to look it up the same way as it does with awesome count, right? So let's go back and do it r the right way this time. And that is in, in the producer, rather than re returning the simple counter, I have to get it from the context. And it's deployed, and it's actually doing the right thing. What about this then? I have to speed up a little bit, but uh, this will get you, if you try to run it without the spring context at all, you will get into trouble with the add order wire. So I don't recommend this approach at all. If you bring a Spring compon component into a Java EA application, make sure that every bean you use from the Spring con uh, component is actually managed by s the Spring context. Otherwise, you get into trouble. So let's uh, have a look at the other uh, uh, way to, to do it. And, and this is to, to use a Spring-based application and inject Java EA stuff into it. If you remember the, the Spring application, uh, I'm now going to use a Java EA compo component, and it's exactly as, as the Spring, only that it's a singleton from J uh, CDI, and the awesome counter is actually an EJV. So if I open the, the Spring application, to be able to use it, I need to add the dependency. And here I also add the Java EE web API, right? Because Spring doesn't provide this for me, but the, con the container does. So it is provided, but my component relies on it, so I have to have it as a dependency for compile time. And then I go into my configuration. In this case, I don't have uh, the producer, the CDI being producer. I just do it in, in the application config for the spring. And then I do the same thing as I did for the, uh, the, um, the uh, Java EA version. I just create a, a bean, says that rather than as producer, so it's at bean. And in the resource, I just auto wire it in and use it. And to speed up, since we're getting out of time, for the other one, which is the EJB, if I want to use this as an EJB, I cannot do that that way uh, to, to inject it with the, the spring context. I actually need to look it up using the at EJB annotation. So here I'm, I'm the 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 uh, when I have the 
EJB on my class path, it will be registered w with the standard uh, JNDI, JNDI name and I can use it directly. So if we look at this example, we're uh, running the spring. Okay, it has to deploy. Run it. Oh, there it goes. Takes a little bit more time when it's spring because it has more things to load. But I'll just run it there. So we run it there. You see, it counts, but it has the same bug as we had uh, in the Java EA example. And that is, what we're doing here is that we are having our resource in the Spring context, and we're looking it up with the at EGB, and we order wiring simple, so we get th the same problem where this one is managed by Spring, and this one is ma managed by CDI. And there are a couple of ways to fix it. One way is to do this. And that is probably the most optimal way, but we don't have time to show that today, and you probably will need a third-party library to do this, or you need to make this one discoverable and bring in some spring stuff here, and maybe you can't do that. So this is probably not an approach you can do anyway. What you can do is, if your application is not dependent on the container, like my EJB is actually not using anything from the com container, then I can let Spring handle it all. And that is uh, pretty easy to do. Then I, I just go into my configuration file, and I just produce a bin directly. And in my resource, I just auto-wire it. And now it actually does it right. But m note that this is actually not what we were intended to do because this one is managed by Spring entirely. So this is where you can get into problem because this, is this one is actually relying on the fact that it is an EJB or it is relying on something in the EJB container but Spring doesn't provide for it, then you, you're uh, pretty much screwed. So that concludes the demo. So let's sum up a little about what we did. Spring 4 and Java E they solve the same problem. The frameworks overlap a lot. They provide much of the same uh, support. Uh, and it's, it's more or less interchangeable. I, I saw somebody uh, on, on Twitter a, uh, a week ago joking that Spring is actually now more or less a reference implementation of Java E. But, uh, but uh, so, so it, it, it's more or less uh, very overlapping. Java E requires less configuration and it requires less dependencies. And fewer dependencies means that you have a smaller WAR file. It means faster deployment times and less risk of unwanted behavior for transient dependencies that some of the Spring components may bring in that you don't want. Spring is more portable than Java E. Since it brings its own uh, container, it, and, and this is actually true even across Java E compliant containers, because there are different implementations, and even though they implement a specification, you may notice that there may be different things. Like Wildfly uses REST easy for JAXRS 
and last week's use was Jersey for Jack's Rest. For the simple case, it's just the same. But for some cases, it actually may differ how they behave, and it may require different configurations. As we saw in a demo, using Spring from a Java E application is not that hard. And that is due to the fact that Spring brings its own framework and container and context and everything it needs with it. And you just have to call into it and get the beans and let Spring handle it itself. And Java E is meant to rely on the container. So whether you're mixing a Spring application from Java E or Java E to Spring, I would recommend that you actually don't do any of them, but if you do, you probably should integrate Spring into Java E because then you have more control that it actually does what it's supposed to do. So to conclude, mixing is possible. It requires a little effort depending on what you're doing, but you should favor one framework over mixing. And I would definitely start with the intention that I'm, that I'm not going to mix anything. And if I'm going to do it, I would think again before I do it. And especially if you go from Spring and integrate some Java E compo component in, then you probably is more likely to get into trouble than if you do it the other way around. And beware the context the beans are running in. And if you bring in beans that are dependent on, s on, on the Spring context, make sure that the Spring context actually handles those beams and don't l take it over in your application. So if you want to see uh, the sources for uh, these examples, it's uh, on my GitHub account. They're freely available, just to use it. Uh, if you don't remember this one, just Google my name and you'll find it, or it, uh, the slides will be uh, released here afterwards. So that was all I had today. Thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure, and I love being here in Krakow. Thank you.